Okay, well, I hope your enthusiasm lasts. We'll see. <laughs> okay, so I am Betsy. I work at a company called Natuitive. Uh, we're a 12-year-old company, and the very first product that the company introduced was effectively an anomaly detection engine for uh, managing data centers. So this talk really comes from two, per, two, per, two perspectives. The first is obviously how do we apply anomaly detection to DevOps? And secondly, really lessons learned. So first, a word from our sponsors, who are our customers. Um, while uh, Netuitive brought really software and some math to the table, our customers bring deep domain expertise, a sense of adventure, <laughs> and a willingness to collaborate. And as a result of the collaboration, uh, we've learned a lot, and that's really a lot of the content of this talk. So, the stories you are about to hear are true. However, the names have been changed to protect the innocent. So first of all, let's start with a definition. Uh, anomaly detection is basically finding patterns that do not conform to expected behavior. That's a fairly abstract definition, but it's useful. And in this first picture, Probably most of you can see the anomaly. The clue here is color, right? All right, let's move on to another example. Here we really have two clues, right? We have color, which is a sort of static property, which is interesting to DevOps, but probably not as interesting as more dynamic properties. And in this particular case, there's a dynamic property, which is the direction in which the little fishy is swimming, right? Here's another example. Presumably you can all recognize this anomaly. The little, red, the little red arrow is next to one of the, the dot. And the, what, the, what the differentiating characteristic here is really distance. The nearest neighbor of that dot with the red, the red, the red arrow is much further than the nearest neighbor of any of the other ones. So the anomaly detection is really all about looking at clues and trying to compare what the attributes are across all those various, uh, you know, the possible places that could be having an, an anomaly. Here's another case where it's a before and after kind of case. And you're looking for differences. And I don't know, it's a little harder to see intentionally. There's one here. I don't know how many of you saw that one. But what's interesting about this, pardon? Yeah. Somebody say something? Yeah. All right. But what's interesting about this particular picture is there's got lots of anomalies. And that's what happens a lot in DevOps, is anomalies don't occur sort of as singletons. They, they occur in groups. OK, last example. This is a more DevOps-esque example. Uh, can you see the anomalies here? Uh, what this is is actual data. It's from a credit card clearing company. And what it's showing is the count of successfully auth authenticated credit card purchases. And uh, the bands are bands of normalcy, which we'll talk about later. But what's interesting here is that there's a pattern, right? The number of credit card transactions that occur at night is basically zero, and then they they, they go up during the day to a sort of a peak, and then they come down in a kind of inverted parabola, right? You can see the anomalies, maybe. These are, these are tough ones to catch. Maybe not by the human eye, but they're tough to catch via software and via algorithms. We'll talk more about that. So anomalies come in a lot of shapes and sizes. They're based a lot on a lot of different types of criteria, and so they're complicated. It sort of takes a village to create an effective implementation of anomalies. So uh, this particular diagram is sort of trying to ca capture that. And at the one hand, you have research that is being performed primarily in academia, maybe in, in labs of big companies. And the research turns out models and algorithms that are mathematically sound. However, for the most part, they're generic. So then you have at the other end of the spectrum sort of the people that are in the trenches fighting fires that are trying to take advantage of anomaly detection in order to do better, 
to, to, to you know, improve the business. And finally, and really very importantly, often overlooked, is that you have entities that are putting this all together, that are matching the models and algorithms with the specific detection requirements that exist in the trenches, and they're wrapping it all into a system where there's ingestion of data, there's applying the various algorithms, they're visualizing the results, raising alarms, whatever they're doing. And what's interesting about DevOps is that quite often now you have companies that are actually sitting in both places. A, a, a typical company that's offering a cloud-based service is not only managing that service, if they're, if they're building a system to do that using anomalies, but they're also living in the trenches as well. You might say eating their own dog food. That's pretty interesting and it's good news. It's making for better systems. So just very quickly, um, these are some of the research areas. Uh, we'll talk about the top two for the most part. Uh, the application areas here, there's lots of them. This is just a few. The good news is, is that um, anomaly detection has been deployed in these types of applications with huge success. There are companies that really depend on it. The bad news is, is that if you, if you try to search around and find how people have been using anomaly detection and more fancy algorithms in DevOps, um, it's, a, it's a thin set of information. It's, that's the bad news, but that's going to change. So here, the rest of the, 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 rest of the talk is about applying uh, anomaly detection to DevOps. So let's look at, start from the top. Let's look at what the DevOps requirements are. I've divided into three areas. We'll first talk about what's data, what data is available to detect the, anom the anomalies, what types of anomalies do you want to detect, and then finally, what kinds of techniques can you use to detect the anomalies and where they succeed and where they fail? First, data. Three areas again, rule of threes, I guess, uh, rules here. Uh, we'll talk about metrics, attributes, and collections. Very briefly, metrics are probably the most fundamental data structure in DevOps. Uh, a time series is essentially a sequential order, it's a sequential set of values or observations. Uh, that all have timestamps and they're typically visualized like this. The interesting thing about them is they can be very long. If you're taking, you know, sub-minute data for a year, that's a long time series. And yet you may need to do that if you want to detect anomalies year over year over year. In the case of the credit card company, you know, they care about Black Friday and that happens once a year. So you may have to keep years of data. Second thing about metrics that's really interesting is they can be really plentiful. It's not unusual to see a data center that's not huge that has perhaps 100,000 metrics, maybe 200,000, maybe a million. Okay, on top of this, what's very important for anomaly detection is to lay over the time series some sort of context. And as you can see in this picture, context is very important. <laughs> So what, what, what sort of forms does context take? Uh, whether well, static attributes, that's sort of familiar, no new news here. Um, in, particular, in particular, for a, a time series, you might want to specify what bytes it's or what, what sort of units it's represented in. That's one of my key peeves, actually. Okay, <laughs> another, um, another type of context is what's called in the BI world or the business intelligence world are slowly changing dimensions. And what's interesting about these is they don't change as fast as a time series, which may change every second or every minute. And they don't, they're not constant, they're somewhere in between. And this is really important in, in elastic computing, in the software defined data center, where big things change. The number of hosts that are, say, uh, you know, uh, in, a, in a cluster or the number of replicated microservices that exist in a particular architecture. These are all slowly changing dimensions and what they have an impact on when something's an anomaly and when, when it's not. Uh, last type of uh, sort of context is collections and this is an example, it's an entity uh, as it would be known in the relational database world and in, in uh, our world we call them an element. An element can be virtual, it can be physical, and this is an example of an element that's a, a method call in a Java application, and it has a number of very dynamic 
attributes represented as time series that describe its state as it moves through time. Another type of collection is driven by the notion of a relationship. Relationships can be by, via containment, such as uh, members in a load balance cluster, or they can be dictated by membership in a workflow. Uh, one such workflow, workflow would be this sort of example here. This is a, a collection that's showing interactions of various things occurring in a workflow. And here, it's a, at a business level, it's at a very high level. You have the four big functional areas you know, of an organization. And down here in the lower right, you have operations. Operations has servers and things like that that it's managing. That affects latency. Latency affects maybe the page load of a website. Then uh, customers can be happy or unhappy as a result of that, and eventually you get uh, profit and revenues. Uh, this is another relationship, and anomalies along that path are important to be able to detect, obviously. OK, that takes care of data. So we have these kinds of data that are available to us to detect anomalies. Now let's talk about what types of anomalies we'd like to detect. There are three. What a coincidence. We have point, contextual, and collective. So one at a time. A point anomaly is an observation that's unusual when compared to all other observations that are available to you. Good example, simple time series. You look at all the values that you've seen of this time series across time, and guess what? One stands out as sort of the outlier. That's a pretty easy to detect anomaly. Well, I just lied. Not so much. <laughs> a lot of open source agents are configured not to report interval data, but to report cumulative data. And all I did was take the data that was on the previous slide and map it to a, con uh, a cumulative map, a cumulative graph. And now this, this anomaly uh, is, is cleverly hidden. Even if you zoom, it's not even that obvious, really. So even simple, simple anomalies, point anomalies, are not, they, they have some nuances. OK, next, next type of anomaly is called a contextual anomaly. This is an observation that's unusual within a certain context, but not in other contexts. Here's an example. There's a before, and then an after, and in between, there's a sudden drop. That looks like a, uh, an anomaly, and uh, you know, various different types of algorithms can be used to detect such an anomaly. But in another context, where you have a sort of seasonal pattern, where you have low um, you know, at night and high during the day, this isn't such, a, such an interesting, it's not an anomaly at all, actually. A sudden drop is very common. Here's another type of contextual anomaly. This is a case, the, the little red dot, this is a case where the value is OK at night, but not OK during the day. So this is, this is, this is the type, of, there's a contextual aspect to anomaly detection that's very important. Last type, a collective anomaly. That occurs when a collection of related data instances is anomalous with respect to the entire set. So what you're thinking about is a set of things and they're changing along in sort of lockstep, and then suddenly one of them goes haywire. OK, so let's look at one of those. Here's an example. We're looking at a very small collection of two metrics. The metrics are, are uh, tracking requests per second over time and revenue per second over time. And basically, each of these x's on this graph is a pair where it's a value of the, the number of requests and then the corresponding value of revenue at the same time. And if you plot these all, this is called a scatter plot, and if you, you plot these all and you use a, a model like linear regression, which maybe you remember from college or high school or something, <laughs> but if you, if you do that, then basically what you can, you can use this information. This is information about the interaction of these two things. You can use that information to predict basically where you would expect the other one to be given the value of the first one. OK, so it says you've got a prior, so to speak, in Bayesian terminology. You've got a prior, which is the request per second. And then you have a dependent variable, which is revenue per second. Let's assume this, this is a website and you're making purchases on it. 
then, then you can expect reasonably, given some certain level of confidence, which you could specify, and the level of confidence will influence the width of the expected band, the band of normalcy, you might say. Uh, this gives you a way to recognize anomalies, because if you see something like this, where the requests are, again, in the same area, same place on the x-axis, but yet revenues are odd, then that's a good candidate for being a, an anomaly. So those are the three types of anomalies. I got these types from academia. They're, all, they're always full of taxonomies and all, but it's useful because uh, uh, different, different algorithms uh, can be used for the different types. Uh, the key differentiator between these types really is the amount of context that is needed in order to detect the anomaly. Okay, so moving right along, we go to techniques. There are two general classes of techniques that I'll cover today, statistical and deterministic, deterministic first. Uh, deterministic is, in my opinion, the unfortunate state of the art in DevOps. We, don't, we make use of deterministic anomaly detect, detection techniques and they get us part way there but not all the way there. So let's look at some examples. Uh, first is dashboards. That's, that's a critical feature, you know, in any product you want to be able to visualize the data and the human eye is great at detecting patterns. So it's, uh, you know, Something like this, you know, is really successful, as you can see in the little up, uh, you know, the thumbs up in the right hand. That, that, that will be a theme throughout the rest of this. So uh, basically, you got a dashboard. It's beautiful. You can look at it, and maybe you can see things from that. And, uh, you know, I know anybody that I've worked with in DevOps relies on these things. The problem is that they don't really scale very well. <laughs> Basically, the true, the, tr the sad truth is that as the number of metrics that you have that you want to graph increases, the likelihood you're going to miss something increases as well. Okay, so that's dashboards. Let's look at static thresholds. This is a great, a great metric for a static threshold, right? You can just put the static threshold in there, and if it goes over that threshold, boom, oh, you've got an, uh, an anomaly, and maybe you raise an alarm, right? Okay, well, basically, it's, uh, the good thing about static thresholds is that they're easy to set, sort of. I may be lying there. Uh, and if you have to set them for a lot, of, a lot of different metrics, it gets to be a big manual problem. So there's a scalability problem as well. And you know, if you set them wrong, you, know, you can have dire consequences. You can get floods of alarms and all that sort of thing. But they're, they're useful, they have their place. And in combination with other things, they can really be helpful, as we'll see. Okay, uh, for a static threshold, a sudden change is a real problem to detect. Uh, you could make the conclusion that lower is bad, in which case, in the first half of this, of this graph, you'd be getting a flood of alarms. And this is what's called the crying wolf effect, where you're being plagued by false statements. Everything's fine but your anomaly detection algorithm is saying this sucks. Same thing as if, if, the, uh, you know, if, the, if, if, uh, if the lower one um, is, is existing and the upper one is viewed as bad, then the, you know, you're going to get alarms in the other half, whatever. Okay, so moving right along. Here's another metric. Uh, this is a, the, the monotonic metric that I showed you before, and a, and a threshold is just not going to work here. So what do you do about that? Well, we'll talk about some, some strategies later. But right now, basically what you end up is the head in the sand effect, where you're missing a real anomaly. You look like your head's somewhere. Uh, okay. What the next sort of deterministic, the last one I'll talk about, is transformations. Uh, these are usually simple functions that are used to um, you know, to convert the incoming data to something that's more usable. Uh, what you can do with these, I'll look at one in particular. There's a delta function, which is essentially taking the difference between two successive uh, observations. If you apply that to the monotonically increasing metric, then you get something where the anomaly is pretty obvious. 
Uh, the problem here is, is that you know you have to, you know you have to, uh, you have to. Uh, the problem is, is that you know sometimes that doesn't work that well due to the fact that uh, you know the changes are are short lived and spurious, and that gives you too much noise. Um, another case here is a uh, uh, of, of applying these particular um, uh, functions is that you can map a a metric to a frequency histogram. What a frequency histogram is doing is it's counting the number of times you've seen each observation or l uh, intervals of observation. And what happens here is that you get a, uh, a sort of a uh, you know, vertical set of bars. And if you look for the short bars, those are the rare observations. So this is a way of, of setting th thresholds kind of without having to actually pick the threshold. That's sort of interesting. Unfortunately, it doesn't work with the type of contextual anomaly that I showed you before. That's a perfectly valid value, and so it's hidden in a high bar. Right? OK. So and again, you get the head in the sand effect. OK, so let's move on to statistical anomaly detection techniques. This is uh, where I think the state of the art is heading in DevOps. So a lot, you're going to see a lot more use in the various tools of this type of technique. We'll talk about two techniques, correlation and machine learning. Uh, what's true of both of these is that they share the same common assumption, that past is prologue. Right? That in another way of saying that in a, in a sort of a data science vernacular is that they're probabilistically stable. Okay, a court, look, talking, looking first at correlation models, uh, you can just see some scatter plots here and the value of a correlation uh, statistic that you can compute. It's called uh, the Pearson product moment coefficient correlation. We'll show you the equation later. But the idea is, is that these scatter plots can be mapped to a number, and the number ranges between minus one and one. And minus one and one are sort of the perfect scores. It means that as one metric moves, the other one moves pretty much the same way. It moves up, and it moves the same amount. Or in the case of minus one, when one goes up, the other goes down, but always pretty consistently the same amount. Okay. So let's, uh, uh, let's look at the, uh, the, the equation here. This is the equation. I decided to put it up for, one, for really two reasons, I guess. The first and most important reason is just that it's, a, it's a actually computationally a very easy calculation. You can easily do it in real time. Uh, with just a little finesse, you can manage any state, you know, state uh, you know, observation over observation kind of requirements. So uh, it's, a, it's a really easy statistic to implement, and it can be useful. Uh, the second reason I put it up is because this is a, a presentation about anomaly detection, and we should have some Greek letters in it probably. Right? So. <laughs> OK, so let's look at an example of, of, of this type of uh, detection, anomaly detection, applying this anomaly detection technique to an anomaly. Here's a case where you have two metrics, and they're almost perfectly correlated. OK, so it's successful at seeing that these are perfectly correlated. And you know, if one goes haywire, like here, then the correlation coefficient actually drops quite a bit. So it's, it's, it's a, a decent detection algorithm, but like all things, there's problems. And here's, here's a problem. What I have is a sort of a night day, you know, night, day seasonal pattern. But what happened is in, the, in, the, in a day right here, suddenly both metrics simultaneously plunged. Okay. So what's happening is you're going to miss that because the correlation is 0.92. It's too high. It's not showing. Uh, it's not showing that anything's really changed. Right. Now, the reason that this particular algorithm failed is not is is because it's looking at the wrong thing, and that's one reason that anomaly anomaly detection can go wrong more than it should. Uh, if you look at this way, look at it this way. Basically, what what is not important in this case is the correlation of behaviors of these two metrics. What's important is their values. So this is a case where maybe a, the threshold is almost better, which is a little counterintuitive. Okay, 
Let's look at the last uh, technique, which is statistical machine learning. And uh, this is uh, uh, becoming increasingly popular, I think, in, in using in DevOps. Um, let's look at how it works first. Uh, there's always, there's phases, and there's a learning phase where essentially you have, you, you throw in test data, or da you, you have a, a period where real data is being thrown at its black box that consists of very, very complicated math and very complicated algorithms that are from a software development perspective and a systems engineering perspective quite difficult to implement, especially if you're running in real time. But you may not run in real time, you may run offline, in which case there's a little bit more latitude. But the idea is the test metrics come in, parameters come out that not only identify what sort of characteristics you're looking for, but what settings they should have so that you can detect anomalies. And then you move into the detection phase where you have both the metrics coming in, the parameters coming in, and the anomalies get detected. And if you're really sophisticated, you can do this in line. And so a DevOps environment being a fairly dynamic system that's changing and over time, you can actually do inline corrective analysis and change the parameters to reflect new normal, that kind of thing, right? So let's just see how this would work. Here again is a picture of the, uh, uh, the, the credit card clearing uh, metric. That's uh, how many credits were, how many, how, how many cards were cleared. And uh, this is a really nice visualization of some really heavy math. So uh, that's good. That's a, a success point. And, you know, you can put the, uh, the, 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 what it's capturing is the raw values, and then it's also capturing what, what we term as bands of normalcy. The idea being that you expect, uh, you expect the metric to have a value within a band, right? So uh, the first band is the sort of green one, and that one's based on a univariate model. What that means is the model is, is looking at just one metric. And it's using the information coming from that single metric to decide what its standard deviation is over time. And then the width of the band is determined by the standard deviation. Uh, the much narrower band is the purple band. And that band is created by, uh, via a multivariate model. In this case, what we're doing is we're using information from n different metrics, where n could be a very large number. And we're determining the standard deviation of one of the metrics, knowing what values are for all the other metrics. Okay? And you do that for all n metrics, and therefore you get a, you, you're using, a, you'll see that the, the, two, uh, the two bands are, are quite different in size. And the reason for that is that the purple band has a lot more information to work with. Not only does it have the metrics data, but it has all of the other metrics data that are participating in that model. And over and above that, it has their interactions. So a multivariate model has a chance to be much, much more accurate. Am I running out of time? Uh-oh, okay. Learning at work, you can see the bands converge. Isn't that nice? Here's a case where we actually detect uh, the anomalies. They're all outside of the band. Here's a case where we're detecting new normal. Let's say we have you know, uh, uh, an EC2 server and we've changed its type. Uh, we decided to save money. So we have a huge, a huge server and then we downsize it. This could be CPU utilization. And what we're doing is we're, we're adjusting to the new CPU utilization, which will be higher because we had a smaller guy. Uh, what happens in this case is that when the transition occurs, you get anomalies, but then it settles out. Okay. Uh, here's the, that was the yin. This is the, really? Yep. Killed. Okay. I only took 28 minutes. You only have 25 Okay. 20 what? You only get 25 minutes. All right. I'm sorry. Then uh, that's it. I, I'm going to give you one last thing, if that's okay. You can add context. It works. But here's the moral to the story. Okay. <laughs>